for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Hey everybody, this is Standing for Truth and the video that you are about to watch is the next video in our series titled, The Best Of. Now I've organized, hosted, and participated in many different debates and discussions. This specific video consists of the discussion portions in the debates between Dr. Ken Hoven and Tony Reed and Dr. Ken Hoven versus Jim Majors. Both debates were extremely enjoyable, extremely engaging, and both a must watch. Guys, enjoy. Now we have a 25 minute discussion period coming up. So let me set my timer for that and uh, the two of you can have an uh, open discussion about the subject. Uh, is what's the evidence for biblical creation? So I'm going to start the timer. 25 minutes for discussion. Have at it. Um, okay, thanks, Ken. Uh, do, you, do you mind if I, if I go first? Please do. Great. Um, so I, I want to correct something that you made in your claim. Uh, tigers and lions can reproduce. Um, it's known as ligers, or they're called uh, tie-ins or tigans, I believe. Tigons uh, or ligers, depends which one is the male, right? Correct, correct. And in fact, that there has been evidence, I believe, of a female liger reproducing with a male lion or a male tiger. Uh, that, that that may be wrong, but um, so I, I guess I would have to see what that taxonomy looks like because when, whenever you say kinds, that's very that's very vague, and I heard a lot of mites in there. So, I mean, do you have a working taxonomy that that fits with the model of uh, the, the known species in the world? Well, I don't think anybody would argue uh, a tiger and a lion are both in the cat family. Sure, I, I agree. Class, they have every retractable claws. You know, dogs don't have retractable claws. Cats do. I think all cats do. I don't know. Yes, but I believe so. To, to, to look at this tiger and lion situation and say they are, they can reproduce. Okay, they may, be, they may be divergent from an original created kind that was somewhere between the two. I don't know how many kinds of cats God made in the Garden of Eden. It uh, doesn't matter to me. There might have been, you know, 50 varieties of, of birds that he made, and they've now diversified into thousands of varieties of birds. They're still bird. Or in this case, they're still cat. Lion, but tiger, it, and jaguar, and leopards are still the same kind of animal, a cat. But, but in, in, in Genesis, when it's talking about the kinds, it actually lists different birds as, as after their kind. Is he talking about birds in general or those specific types of birds? Like, I, I know you have a, an argument about the woodpecker. Do you believe that the woodpecker is a kind all of its own? I don't know how many varieties of woodpeckers there are. Uh, quite a few, actually, varieties of woodpeckers. There's a red-headed woodpecker. Sure. I'm, I'm not an expert on birds, but uh, let's let's assume a number and say God created 50 kinds of birds. Okay. I don't think woodpeckers, I don't think woodpeckers are uh, ancestral, have an ancestor common with eagles or hummingbirds. That would just be a guess on my part. This is called barominology. There's a website, barominology.com. Baromen is the Hebrew word for kind. Barominology.com is a group of folks trying to solve exactly this. How many kinds of animals did Noah take on the ark? So of course, Noah is not required to take insects or fish only animals on land whose nostrils, in whose nostrils was the breath of life. But their current guess is about 8,000 kinds of animals had to go onto the ark. And uh, this okay. would ex exclude anything in the water, because they have plenty of water outside. So how many kinds of bird is a woodpecker the same kind as an eagle? I'd say probably not. But sure. keep in mind, keep in mind, I am not asking my theory to be taught in school at taxpayer expense. You guys who believe woodpeckers <laughs> and, tomatoes and tomatoes are related, you believe a woodpecker is related to a tomato. Don't you? If you go back far enough, um, I, I believe that there are DNA similarities. I don't. I, I wouldn't say that they're related necessarily. I, I think that that would be a, a gross misrepresentation of what, what relation is. If I can show you a chart from the textbooks, and there are thousands of them, showing birds and mosquitoes and tomatoes going back with lines to a common ancestor that was single celled. That is what the books teach. I think you have to admit that. So, at least the textbooks teach. Birds, mosquitoes, and tomatoes have a common ancestor. Somewhere way back there, long ago and far away. That's okay. not science. That's nonsense. 
so looking looking at your claim, you're talking about woodpeckers and eagles and storks, and we, we can name a variety of a variety of birds that that can't necessarily interbreed and that that are very much different. Flamingos, uh, sure. ostriches. Um, <clears throat> Craniofacia, looking at a hummingbird, looking at an eagle, looking at a, at a at a hawk, looking at them all side by side, primofacia without any any text, whether it be a textbook or, or a Bible, uh, wouldn't you agree that they are that they likely have an an, a common ancestor? No, no, no. The fact that there are similarities, i.e., they have feathers, just birds that have feathers. There are two, at least two basic types: those that can fly and those that can't. I sure, think you can I, I, I'm referring to more like bone structure. Um, uh, sure. I mean, I mean, when you take like uh, like a an eagle and a hummingbird, for example, the hummingbird can has a longer beak for for accessing uh, um, uh, nectar, um, right. and the the eagle, you know, it has talons and, and a sharp beak for ripping apart its its prey. Um, but you take away the feathers, you take away the meat, and you just look at the bones and the bone structures, and there's an, an incredible amount of similarities there. So did, did God create different kinds that looked alike? Well, I think if you look at all the cars built by General Motors or say Chevrolet, sure. and if you take away, take away the paint, take away the body, take away the electrical, I think you find the frame of many of them is probably identical. Right. I, there are some that come down the line and they use the exact same frame to build a two door or a four door or a hatchback. That's proof of a common designer. That's an engineering feat, not answer. So somebody engineered it where the same frame can supply, you know, two door, four door, hatchback, pickup maybe. But could that's, 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 could, it, could an intelligent designer not have created um, simple organisms that would have been able to evolve a frame, so to speak, that evolved into different hatchbacks or sedans or coupes or whatever? Well, there's no, there's no evidence of any animal changing to any other kind. So that would be, there's no evidence. Sure, there is, there's, there's millions of, of transitional fossils, but I mean, I, I really don't want to get into, into, into evolution. I, I would rather stay on the, the, the creation sure. claim in Genesis. Okay. I, think, I think the creator of the kinds gave us overwhelming evidence that it had to be created. He used the same frame for the birds. Generally, they have a similar shoulder joint and hip joint, okay? But he used a completely different idea for insects. They have the skeleton on the outside exoskeleton and so he gave it so that there's so much evidence that you'd have to be a fool to not see there's a designer here he can design animals that can live with a skeleton on the outside or skeleton on the inside are there cars that have the frame on the outside like a unibody well yeah actually there are but again sure. that's a design an engineering feat not ancestral well it, it's so I, it, it, I'll, I'll agree with you that it's a design feat in that it, it suits a purpose. Like, for example, a roll cage in, in NASCAR, it has a purpose. It's not, in, it's not in every car, but it's in NASCAR because if the car flips, you want to protect the driver. And, right. I mean, all I'm seeing in exoskeletons and, and things of that nature, things used for both defense and offense, are just attributes that are attained through the pressures of their environment that they change and adapt to. So you think the exoskeleton came as a result of pressures from the environment. In other words, the, the insect developed this to prevent himself from being eaten. Uh, I'm, I'm saying, I'm not saying that, that that's why it prevented it, but I'm saying that the ones who did, who did uh, produce it, who did have an exoskeleton, that they were the ones who were more suitable to survive within their environment. And you realize, of course, what you're stating is not based on evidence. It's based on a theoretical uh, belief. Uh, that there's no, 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 nobody's ever seen any animal start to gradually produce an exoskeleton. Well, sure, Either. and we've, we've never seen a star born. Uh, we've never seen a star's life cycle, but we have looked at multiple stars and we have seen multiple stages and multiple stages of growth and death within stars that we have been able to, uh, to make an amalgamation uh, and a better understanding of the life cycle of the star, even though we haven't observed the full life cycle of a star with the human eye. Well, you're starting with your uh, religious belief that stars do indeed go through a cycle and are born and die. I, I think I, we have I, I, that's not a religious belief, Kent. I, um, I think it is. Okay. Suppose I had a belief that cars came from uh, slowly evolved. I could show you evidence that there are one-wheeled vehicles out there called unicycles. I could show you evidence that there are two-wheeled vehicles, bicycles, motorcycles. I could show you and bring in physical evidence there are three-wheeled vehicles. I could actually arrange them in order. One wheel, two wheel, three wheel, four wheeler. Does that prove that's how it happened? No. Nope. 
Not at Absolutely all. Not. And you guys arranging these things in order that you already think it happened. That's where the problem is. You're doing exactly like I would be, but if I arranged the vehicles in order from one, two, three, four wheel. That's okay. not science. If you group them by the will, but but you are grouping them by kinds, and that is not science because there is no scientific evidence to support your claim of kinds. There is overwhelming scientific observable evidence that dogs produce dogs, and that's it. Never an uh, exception. Yes, you're absolutely right, and the evolutionary model actually supports that. You don't see a non-dog coming from a dog in the evolutionary model unless you're speaking well, extreme okay. hyperbole. Unless you're speaking in hyperbole. Think what you just said. Dogs will always produce dogs. However, going back in time, which we cannot do, but if you could go back in time, the dog came from an amoeba or a single cell creature, which was certainly a non-dog. So somewhere along the line, the amoeba produced a non-amoeba, and the amoeba, you think, turned into both a dog and a mosquito, because you have lines on paper connecting them. Then somewhere, even though today mosquitoes only produce mosquitoes and dogs only produce dogs, you in your imagination think, Dogs and mosquitoes are related, so it had to come from something that was non-amoeba or right. bacteria. So, so why could it, it? It could happen in the past, but it can't happen today. So we okay. can't observe so, it. Or it's not science. So we don't see a a non a non dog coming from a dog. We don't see a dog coming from a non dog. And you say there's no reason to to believe that because we can't go back in time to observe that. So what I want to know is why you feel so confident in the claim that men came from mud and the breath of a deity. Um, <laughs> when you can't go back, and there's no evidence that we came from mud. There's no scientific evidence to support that. Well, General Motors makes all their cars out of natural components that come right out of the ground. They take iron ore, melt it down, make the iron. They add a little nickel or other elements to it, depending on what kind of steel they want. So you could argue that a car is made of 100% natural components, but it had a designer to do it. The mud didn't turn itself into a car, but they took the elements out of the dirt or the mud or the rock. So to say that how do you know that? <laughs> well, we know it because we observe it. We don't. We did not observe no, God creating we don't man. Observe it. We have never observed man coming from mud. Never. No. No. We do observe cars coming from natural components. We can observe them digging out the iron ore, melting it down, making the iron, forging it into shape. Every step of a car production can be observed. We do sure. not observe God making man from the mud. I agree. That's why it's a belief. You do not observe a mosquito and a dog coming from a common ancestor. That's why it's a belief. But it's taught in the textbooks, and we're all paying for that religion to be taught. This one says animals, fungi, and plants have a common ancestor. But that's uh, not science. That's but automobiles you guys, do not that. that. that that's, you're, I mean, that's, that, that, that's a fallacy, I believe. I mean, because we're not talking about something that can reproduce. We're talking about something that does have a designer, but it's designed to suit a purpose. It's designed to suit a need to, to fill a, a, a slot, so to speak. Um, and your creation account is nothing more than that. It is a creation, a, 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 a design to fill a spot. And that spot is... Um, solidifying the identity of ancient Israelites, of, of ancient Canaanites, of ancient Babylonians, depending on which, which creation myth that you want to read. Well, sure, you can believe that. This is straight from one of the textbooks used today. It says animals, fungi, and plants have a common ancestor. Do you believe fungus and elephants and uh, tomatoes are related, have a common ancestor? This what the, that's what We're all paying so, for this to go in the textbooks. So uh, when, when you say believe, um, do I just believe that? No, but do I accept that other people have done the research and do I accept the evidence? Then, then yes, I do. And I, I would like to add that I find it much more plausible than to say that God did it um, and he created us from, from mud and that plants live for an entire day in sub-zero temperatures without a sun. Well, like you brought up several topics that need to be uh, addressed there, but you, you, keep, you guys keep wanting to use the word accept. You accept evolution. You have sure. to believe evolution. You guys keep trying to sneak that in. You have to accept truth. You do not sure. have, to, but you have to believe that you believe mosquitoes it. are related. This right. Text you, you, you can believe it, but there's evidence for that belief. There's justification to believe that. Okay. I think there's evidence to prove dogs always produce dogs and cows always produce cows. That's where the evidence lies. Do you now, believe there's evidence that man was created from mud? No, I can't. I could. I think we're made out of natural elements. I think you could find all the elements for man's body in the mud. So you're interpreting that part allegorically because it doesn't suit your narrative. 
I'm saying there is a narrative. There's a book that says God did it. I don't know of a better answer, but. Sure. I'm and, not and you're interpreting part of it literally and part of it allegorically to fix whatever gaps you have in your understanding. Well, no, you guys are one of the ones with all the gaps in the understanding. We observe cows produce cows, dogs produce dogs. Yes, you do. That's okay. It's okay to have gaps, Ken. Well, then call it, then stop saying you accept it. Admit you believe it. It's a belief. It's a sure. religion okay, yes. on your part. Okay. okay, I believe it, but I have justification for my belief. I have justification for my belief. Nobody's ever seen a cow produce a non-cow. Therefore, somebody must have made the original cow. You do have justification for your own belief, for your belief, but your belief itself does not have justification to be believed by anybody who would, uh, other than people who would just accept it on faith. Well, I think you need to look in the mirror. Uh, you're, you're, uh, uh, Jim, you're the one who has a, a religious a belief that is not based on any scientific evidence. This textbook shows all the bats in the world are related to the horses and are related to the mice. They put them all together to draw, what they draw lines on paper is all they do. On the outside, no, of the that's not what you can't. No, the, the, the current working evolutionary model has been used for many things from developing antibiotics to discovering how bacteria works. The, the current evolutionary model works every day in laboratories, and we, we make new discoveries because we operate under the assumption that we evolve. Well, the same laboratories could use the assumption that, wow, a designer made these creatures out of the same 92 elements out of the ground. Maybe there are uh, antibiotics that can be used because they have a common ancestor, common designer. And I think we'd be wasting our time because scientists would be trying to figure out what kind of mud God used and what was what what his breath contained, what the atmospheric uh, contents of his breath were. And that's that's absurd because there's no need to go to that when there's already a working model. Now, if you want to debunk the working model and you want to show inconsistencies, then I would encourage you to accept your Nobel Prize. Well, I think if you went to North Korea, you would not find any opposition to the idea of communism. Sure. I think any. Well, Anybody no, opposed actually, I, I disagree. If you go into the individual homes that are being oppressed, I'm sure that there would be some. Uh, sure. uh, uh, if anyone dares to speak out against communism, they end up, you know, executed or down the bottom of the Pacific Ocean someplace. Right. Uh, Excommunicated for heresy, so to speak. I think we have a very similar, not quite as severe, but same, same thing with those who oppose evolution in the academic circles. It wasn't this way 200 years ago. But it has, evolution religion has slowly taken over our school system, where now if you dare to oppose it, you don't get published. You don't get promoted. You actually get fired. Watch the movie Expel to see those who say, look, I don't think evolution works. They'll get fired from their job. Sure, because we're talking about the separation of church and state. People who, who make these assumptions under theological pre presuppositions do not need to be teaching in the public school system. They do not need to be funded by our government, which clearly states that there needs to be a separation between theology and, uh, and government. Thank you. I would point out those who believe mosquitoes and tomatoes are related, regardless of how much time you want to give them, should not be allowed to teach that to children. I, I don't think do. that people should be allowed to teach anything that cannot be demonstrated. I don't believe people should be uh, allowed to teach anything that there's not evidence to believe that, such as God created man and then later created woman from, from his side. Uh, I, I think it's totally, totally absurd. And again, there's no evidence that that women were made um, from, from man. Uh, I mean, we, we can go into the the different creation accounts we can go into authorship and everything like that i don't think it's necessary but i i, I do encourage you to read the 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 difference in in accounts uh, as far as to when god made woman uh, between the uh, the account in genesis 1 and the account in genesis 2. yeah i could not prove scientifically that woman was made from a rib from man i think we can show that there are obvious uh, structural okay. similarities and digestive tract is about identical and there are thousands of thousands of identical systems between men and women. Uh, praise God for the differences too. But there are obviously some, some similarities. Again, I would say that may be an indication of a common designer, just like the Ford, uh, just like the two door and the four door and the hatchback have the same frame, same electrical system, same paint job. It doesn't prove Wait, common ancestors. You, said, common you, said you, you, just, you just said that you had evidence that women was created from a rib. Can, can you, can I, you, can I, you I can cannot prove that. I can't prove that scientifically. That's what you the text says. Oh, but by the way, you can't disprove that either. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I, can't disprove, yeah. I can't disprove that that women wasn't made by um, scrunching up some silk and wrapping it in duct tape. Um, That's not what the text says. The text says the woman was made from man's rib. Sure. The purpose of this debate well, is is the taken from evidence of biblical creation. Do you have any evidence to counter that? Forget the duct tape. The Bible says Eve was made from a rib. By the way, there's only one bone in the human body that will grow back if you take it out, and yeah. that's your rib. Well, uh, I would like to, to clarify, to point How out. Do they know that? That? 
that, you know that, that you said that there is no evidence that women a woman was created from a rib. So I will I'm sure you've heard this saying that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. So there's no reason for me to try to disprove it because you haven't in any way proved that women came from a rib. Okay, that which is, has no evidence can be dismissed. There is no evidence a dog came from anything other than a dog. Not going yeah, forward, there is. produce dogs in the future. If you think in the past, a dog came from a non-dog. There's no evidence of a dog ever coming from a non-dog. We can dismiss the whole evolution theory. There is no evidence of any dog coming from a non-dog in the past. There's no, no evidence of the 6,000-year-old earth kin. That's what you're changing topics here. You're diverging. Okay. No, 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 I'm talking about claims versus evidence for the claims. And I, I would have, argue that I have much more evidence. Now, while it's not complete, while it is, yes, it is a theory, but it is a working theory. There is truth within the theory. If, if, if anything in there con conflicts with, with what we know to be true, then it's thrown out. It's no longer considered a, a theory, Kent, like, like gravity. Yay. Well, then throw it out because we've only seen dogs produce dogs, and you think dogs and mosquitoes have a common ancestor. Throw that theory out, son. That's not yeah. science. Yeah, there, there, is ge there is genetical information. There's genetical data that ties us all together. Do you, do not, do you deny that? We don't. Well, that, again, that could be a common design. I think the Fords and the Chevys are both made out of steel. comes on from the same dirt. Doesn't and, their yes, and, they're, and they're also not living beings. So I think that's a, that's a, that's a false, uh, uh, false representation. Well, you're giving a false representation saying, wow, look, we don't see dogs always produce dogs in the future. But in the past, you think it was different. That's not science. That's a religion. You believe dogs came from something, a single cell. You believe that single cell creature produced something that was it turned, you know, ultimately turned into a dog. This is a religious belief, Jim. This is not science. And I wish you guys would And what do you forces. believe? What do you believe? Where, where do you believe the animals came from? Where do you believe man came from? I don't see any other option than to say there must be a designer that made this. If I walked into a town that was deserted out west, you know, John, John Wayne, a deserted desert town, a cowboy town, I look at these buildings and say, well, there's nobody here, but I think somebody built these buildings. I could walk into a town. I could find an arrowhead and say, I think somebody made this. I mm -hmm. don't know who. I don't know but somebody made it. I think you can look at a mosquito under a microscope and say, wow, this has amazing design, digestive system. It can fly for heaven's sake. That's complicated. It can reproduce. You talk about a complicated system. Reproduction is mind-bogglingly complex in all the things that have to happen just right. Any system, the eyes, of the, the, the smelling system is so complex, I would say it's logical to say there's a designer. Now, who is that designer? Is it Allah, Buddha, Jehovah? That becomes a different set of arguments. But to get over her, somebody designed a mosquito. Gym. Okay, so, so you, you believe that this was all designed and it was done by a creator and it is centered around around us, I believe. I believe that you believe that humans and the God of the Bible have a unique uh, connection, correct? Oh, yeah. I, I believe there's three different okay. kinds of if, life. I think if there's that is the case, then why is it that out of, <clears throat> out of all, <clears throat> my apologies, out of the entire electromagnetic spectrum, humans can can only see less than 0 0.004 of it it's like 0 0.0035 percent oh. of the entire electromagnetic spectrum um right. humans, humans for example in in uh in uh in wavelength reception uh humans can only recept uh, somewhere between 380 to 740 nanometers but you right. then have you have uh beings like the mantis shrimp who uh, i don't believe are, are uh, um, hoping for salvation or that they were created for any divine purpose and yet their wavelength reception is much better than ours 300 to 720 so a much wider range of wavelength reception so there's so much that is created that is not for us in, in genesis 1 it tells us that these stars were made to be signs for for planting crops and signs for recognizing the changes of the seasons and some would argue that it, uh, the zodiac yet but um two it says minutes that, gentlemen that they were created for that reason yet we know for a fact that there are stars in our universe that not only have we not seen with the naked eye but we will probably never see and how do you know that for a fact well, be, uh, are you familiar with the term the the, the universe horizon or the, uh, the the horizon effect? Yeah, yeah, yes, I understand. I, I believe you're probably true, but you don't know that that's correct. I'm just pointing out this is a belief. I well, believe the same thing. Okay, yes, I, I don't I don't know in an epistemological sense, as in it hasn't been been uh, um, uh, demonstrated to be completely true. Like there's not I'm not holding it in my hands. You're right. There is no conclusive study. But at the same time, I have justification to believe that. And there's no reason for me to say, 
well, God created these stars for humans. And uh, well, this is this has to be all there is because the Bible says so. OK, I have justification. If I walk into a deserted cowboy town out west, I would have justification for believing somebody made this. Even yes, though the and you can find out who you can't you can find out who through archaeology. You can find out through, through, through experimenting from the past, from the testing. Okay, let's allow uh, Dr. Holman just to have equal time with response there. Go ahead, Dr. Holman. The buildings, the buildings in this cowboy town are made out of wood and probably nails, which are made from iron. Those are natural components. We can see trees growing all over, but we never see wood cut into those shapes and nailed together in that way. It would be logical to say somebody built this building or made this town, laid it out in a street down the middle, you know, and buildings on the side. Maybe there's a reason for that, you know, traffic flow. I think we can study the human body or the body of a mosquito or a star and say there's a reason for this. If you'd rather be a mantis shrimp to get their eyes, that's up to you. Go ahead and swap eyes if you'd like. But I think maybe the reason we see a small part of the spectrum is that God's got a big surprise for us when you go to heaven. Hey, guys, new eyes. You can see the whole thing. You can now see the sounds. Whoa, that'll be cool. I don't know, but I, I'm looking forward to going there. I, I would like you to come too, Jim. Would you like to come? I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, it would be cool, Kent. I, I, I do not disagree with you. It would be cool to go to an afterlife where I don't hurt anymore, where my senses are enhanced, where... Uh, where I didn't have to worry about anything, where I could see my loved ones, I could, I could meet my family, you know, I could, uh, um, you know, experience, you know, all this, this peace. Um, but that's time, gentlemen. It, but it's, it's available. There's no evidence that, that that is true. I'd like to address some of the points he made. Give me whatever time I take. He can take the same time. Beautiful. That sounds good, Dr. Holman. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Yes, uh, Tony, you got this, quite a few things. I'd love to have to take a couple hours on some of these, but. Uh, uh, but the Earth having just the right amount of oxygen, et cetera, for life, you know, Venus is too much CO2 and too, Mercury is too hot and Mars is too cold. Does, did, does it ever occur to you that maybe that would be a prediction that the creator designed this planet to hold life? And this is the only one that holds life that we know of. You guys spend an awful lot of money looking for life everywhere else, but nothing, nothing's ever been found for sure. So I think maybe it, uh, that'd be, re and the idea that Predictions and backwards. I think you really are really completely missing the point on this one, Tony. If a police officer comes to an accident and tries to investigate and find out who did what, who hit who, who was where, what were the cars going, they don't sit around the police office and, and predict, oh, there's going to be an accident on 4th Street in 20 minutes. Let's go find it. They wait till after the accident, go find it, and try to figure out what happened. This is perfectly logical, common sense 101, to go find a fossil in the dirt and say, well, what happened? And you, you guys put all of your emphasis on these fossils, and you're completely missing the point. No fossils count as evidence for evolution. None. You don't know those bones had any children, and you certainly don't know they had different children that lived. And if animal did produce a different baby that was different than itself, who would, it, who would that one marry? You've got a host of problems. The fact is, every farmer on the planet in the history of the world can tell you Cows produce cows, dogs produce dogs. There are no exceptions, none. Now, if you want to use a fossil as evidence, that's ludicrous. In a court of law, they'd laugh you out, saying you don't know these bones had any kids. Now, you come across something like this in California. What happened here? Was this slow, gradual sinking of the highway, or is this maybe a catastrophe, like an earthquake or something? Which would have more predictive, which would have more expl explanatory power, a catastrophe or slow, gradual uniformitarianism? How about this? You come, come across this situation. Wow. Did this happen slowly or is this a result of a catastrophe? Oh, how about this? You think they laid the railroad tracks that way? Or do you think maybe this is a result of a catastrophe of some kind, the earth shifting back and forth? So which has better explanatory power, a catastrophe or gradual uniformitarianism? You're, you're supposed to defend the idea that the evolution theory, which is uniform, gradual changes, can explain things. I don't think gradual changes can explain this or this. I think this is a result of a catastrophe. I think anybody with one eye and, and half a brain and common sense would say, this was a disaster. Something happened here. And you couldn't predict it necessarily. I mean, they try to predict earthquakes, but good luck with that one. Uh, ask the folks that have been trying for decades. They just happen sometimes. How about lightning strikes? Can you predict that? One hit one of the tree outside our building here a couple of days ago. So the Bible warned us the scoffers would come and they would walk after their lust, and they would not endure sound doctrine. I think I could look at a map of, say, San Francisco Bay. You go all the way from Redding to Bakersfield, California, and it's very low elevation, beautiful farmland in here, because it obviously was once a big lake. 
which has more scientific application, slow, gradual catastro uh, slow gradual erosion or catastrophic failure. Would it be common sense to say there might have been an earth dam across here where now San Francisco is, backing up a big lake after who knows when, a number of years, it went over the top, washed out the dam, and drained the lake. And now we have beautiful soil at the bottom of the lake. I think that's easy to explain. I think El Paso, Texas is the same way. Why is it called El Paso? Because it's the pass through the mountains. If you, on each side, north and south of El Paso, there are mountains. If you were to plug that area up right across there with a dam, a big lake would fill in. I think sometime probably after Noah's flood, the lake spilled over the top and carved out El Paso in a, in a short time. So the people say Grand Canyon, the textbook says Grand Canyon was cut by the Colorado River slowly over millions of years. That's ludicrous. That's lie number one in my series I talk about. It's just not common sense. Grand, the top of Grand Canyon is 8,000 feet above sea level. Where it starts cutting is less than 3,000 feet. Rivers don't flow uphill in Arizona or Alabama. Or I never did get here what your state, what state you're from or your background. I didn't get here that. But anyway, so James Hutton's book started this whole thing. And I'll skip some of this here, but you can watch my video series. The key is the present is not the key to the past. Catastrophes are everywhere. And I mean, evidence of catastrophes. And you can't always predict a catastrophe. You go there after it happened and say, whoa, what happened here? And they try to put the pieces together. This is detective work 101. So I think if when they, get to, when they got to the top of Mount Everest, they found petrified clams in the closed position. Closed clams. I would say, I would look at this evidence and say, hmm, what happened here? Apparently the clam was buried alive and couldn't even open. Today you can walk along the beach and find a billion seashells, but they hardly ever find a matched pair. So finding a matched pair of seashells closed and petrified, I think it would be common sense 101 to say it was buried alive before it, had, it couldn't even open. Today, a clam dies, opens, the seagulls eat it, the crabs eat it, something eats it, it's gone in, in minutes, and it falls apart into two shells. These are found 10 feet thick in North Alabama, beds of petrified closed clams 10 feet thick. Did this happen slowly by gradual uniformitarian processes? Or were those clams buried in a catastrophe? The very fact that we find fossils at all is evidence of a catastrophe, because animals die all the time and they get scattered around by the coyotes and buzzards. They don't fossilize, and they certainly don't fossilize in, in where the uh, bones are all still articulated. You showed a picture of a guy standing on the back of a turtle for, working on another fossil, and the turtle's hanging up, standing upright. Look at your own pictures, Tony. This had to be rapid barrow with a whole lot of strata forming very quickly. This isn't slow, gradual accumulation of strata. You showed a picture of what is obviously a result of catastrophe. And the Noah's, Noah's flood would explain all that. Uh, rap, let's see. Uh, real world applications. What on earth is the real world application of digging up bones in the dirt and claiming it's the ancestor of somebody when you don't know it had any kids? The real world application for creation is, I predict, as we dig almost any place on the planet, we're going to find strata. Why would there be limestone layers, one layer that covers nearly the whole United States? Was that slow, gradual accumulation, or would that be maybe Noah's flood? Uh, why would there be layers of gravel? We've got gravel. This is a gravel pit we live in here. Why is gravel rounded? All over the world, you find gravel, and it's rounded. This was in a rock tumbler. This was tumbled back and forth for months during Noah's flood. Why would you say, I would predict gravel worldwide will be round. I've never been to Nepal, but I bet if we went over and got some gravel from Nepal, we'd find it's rounded too. I bet if we got gravel from South Africa, it would be rounded. I bet if we get gravel from Ecuador, it'll be rounded. I'd be willing to predict without even going to these countries, the gravel in those countries is rounded. How's that for a prediction, Tony? I think it's because of the Noah's flood was worldwide. Now, you don't want to believe in that flood, I understand, because it represents the judgment of God. No fossils count. There are six meanings to the word evolution. I'll be glad to debate that with you any time. You guys try to give examples of minor changes, microevolution, and claim that that somehow proves the whole theory that we all came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago. That is ludicrous. That's not common sense. Okay. Uh, how long did I take there? Slide number 101, Alt-DV. Um, you're at about uh, seven and a half minutes, Dr. Holden. Okay, I'll give you a couple more here. Dogs, there, there are 339 recognized breeds of dogs. Which has more scientific application? Creation or evolutionism, the, the title of the debate. They're still bringing forth after their kind. The Bible says they would always bring forth after their kind. Dogs produce dogs. So which has more scientific application? Are they still bringing forth? Is this still a dog and this still a dog? 
is that evidence they came from an amoeba? By your theory, they came from an amoeba. So, well, dog breeders, dog breeders will tell you there are limits to the dog variations. Can you ever get one as big as Texas or one as small as a flea? There are animals as small as a flea, you know, like a flea. So why don't we get a dog as small as a flea? Which has more scientific application? Well, my Bible says they're going to bring forth after their kind. I think that's what we see. Your theory says, your theory says humans and dogs and whales and fish and trees all had a common ancestor. Does evolution theory that everything is related to a common ancestor, does that have some kind of application to real world? The Bible says they'll bring forth after their kind 20 times in the first seven chapters, 10 times in the first chapter. Every farmer in history knows the scientific application of believing this. It works every time. When they crossbreed their cows, they expect to get a calf, and they get one. The Bible says they'll bring forth after their kind. Now, Charlie Darwin wrote a book called The Origin of Species. What all we've ever seen is what's called microevolution. They say in this uh, Berkeley University, pesticide resistance, herbicide resistance, antibiotic resistance are examples of microevolution. It's still the same kind. It's a bacteria, this, which has more scientific application. They still bring it forth after their kind. The Bible predicted that would happen. So what exactly is the real science behind antibiotic resistance? Is this herbicide resistance enough to convince you that humans and all these creatures have a common ancestor? How about the sparrow population? Did you know up in the north where it gets colder, the sparrows are slightly larger than they are down south? They need a bigger body to stay warm, and this is one of the evidences for evolution. Hello, it's still a sparrow. Is that microevolution, which has more scientific application? They're still bringing forth after their kind. A three-year-old will tell you it's a sparrow, or at least a bird. What exactly is the science you're trying to teach us here, Tony? Do you think this variations in the sparrow population is enough to convince us that humans and birds and pine trees have a common ancestor? How about the mosquito population? They've discovered now, because of global warming, Berserkley University warns us, that this mosquito has evolved in response to global warming. Really, what did it evolve? Well, it evolved, the f it now waits nine more days before it goes dormant. Oh, so instead of June 1st, it goes dormant on June not 10th, or whatever the date is, at 50 degrees north latitude. Uh, hello, it is still a mosquito. They're still bringing forth after their kind, a mosquito. The fact that it waits nine extra days to go to sleep, is that evidence enough to convince you that mosquitoes and sparrows and whales came from an amoeba? And you want that to be forced on everybody in the school system? Every kid has to learn that? It's still a mosquito, for heaven's sake. We see these charts in the books all the time. Animals and bacteria and plants all have a common ancestor. This is not science. This is propaganda. What is the scientific application for believing that animals and mosquitoes have a common ancestor? Where does this fit in? They did it. Kent Hovind taught me real science. One of your segments, Tony, you did a year ago. I'm trying to teach you, Tony, some real science, okay? They're going to bring forth after their kind. There's no real scientific evidence that any of these animals are related to each other. There's no evidence that any of these creatures on these charts even had children. You there's, there's no way to prove they had children that lived. If you want that to be your grandpa, go ahead. I don't care what you believe, but it's not science. There's no real scientific evidence that any of these living things are related. You cannot, prove sci you cannot give scientific evidence that a human and a spider have a common ancestor. What would the scientific application be of believing that a human and a spider and a seaweed have common ancestor? This is ludicrous, okay? But these kind of charts are all over the books. I got hundreds of them here in my library. They're saying the humans and the jellyfish have a common ancestor. Oh, and so do all the rest of them. Tony, what is the scientific application of believing in evolution? I see no scientific evidence, there's no, no application for it. It's a completely useless, useless theory. It doesn't predict anything. The flood would form all these layers, all these fossils, the rounded gravel, did it all very quickly. Your turn, Tony, let's hear it. Thank you. Okay, so Mr. Hoven seems to um, understand the idea of an explanation. And yeah, creationism can exp explain a lot of things, but that doesn't give it scientific application. What gives something scientific application is that it can predict the future evidence which means it has a real world application. And you know, in, in the funny thing is, you stated that no fossils would ever count as evidence in a court of law because we can't prove that any of them ever were reproducing. Seems that you've forgotten about the Dover trial when fossil whales among other lineages were in fact accepted as ev evidence for evolution. This is a court of law. 
I wonder if you've ever thought about the oft-made claim by scientists, however, that even if we had zero fossils, we would still have overwhelming evidence for evolution. Now, this is where the prediction comes in. The idea that a spider is related to, you know, I don't know, a, a human or, or to a tree. This overwhelming evidence comes in the form of genetics. The fact that we can demonstrate genetic relationship between organisms. You may argue that this is not evidence of a common ancestor, but of a common designer. But once again, I'll point out that this was never predicted by creationists until after this homology was discovered. The reason we know about this homology, however, is because it came about by testing the prediction made ahead of time by the theory of common descent. And since scientific predictions are falsifiable, if we hadn't seen homology between species, common descent would have needed to be severely revised. Yet creationism would have been unaffected because it is unfalsifiable, unfalsifiable. Because if we did see no homology, you'd still be a creationist, wouldn't you? That's why creationism is scientifically useless. But let's go ahead and get back to the courts of law. This genetic test that we use to determine genetic relationship between species is the very same genetic test that we use to legally determine relationship between people. This not only continues to confirm, confirm the predictions of common descent every time we map the genome of a new species, but it also constitutes legal proof of common descent. Now, that said, you were talking about the Grand Canyon saying a river can't flow uphill, and I completely agree. That's absolutely true. As it turns out, the entire area of the Grand Canyon is continuously rising due to subcrustal forces at a rate of 0.6 millimeters per year. The Kaibab uplift at the canyon space is also uplifting at various rates. These alternating uplifts have been responsible for the course changes in the river, river several times in the geological history. So the answer to your question is that the Colorado River never did flow uphill. The area rose around it. Now that said, uh, con you, you talked about uh, the Big Bang there. Now, um, with this, I didn't think you'd actually bring it up, but many people have cited that the Big Bang theory is a prediction of a creation event. I don't think you say that, but they'll even go so far as to point out that Georges Lemaitre, who popularized, popularized the theory, was himself a creationist. But contrary to popular belief, this cosmological model was first formulated in 1922 by Alexander Friedman to little attention until rediscovered in 1927 by Georges Lemaitre. The model states that at some point in the finite past, all of the matter and energy in the universe was much closer, perhaps even being condensed into a volume as small as an atom. Now, using this model, in 1946, George Gamow published a paper describing how radiation can recombine and become basic atoms after a Big Bang. He theorized that in the process of recombination, microwaves would be released at a temperature of 50 Kelvin. Now, this estimate was revised several times over the following years as quantum, quantum mechanics was discovered, and I'll probably discuss that later. But in 1964, Robert H. Dick, Jim Peebles, and David Wilkinson at Princeton University were preparing to search for microwave radi radiation as a means of testing their own theory. And they felt that the cosmic background radiation would have been released along with matter at the Big Bang and due to billions of years of redshift would be at a temperature of under five Kelvin. It so happened that at the same time, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson we're working at nearby Bell Labs, experimenting on bouncing radio waves off of Echo Balloon satellite. And after canceling out any potential radio sources, they continued hearing a slow, low, steady, mysterious noise that persisted in their receiver. And they found that no matter where they pointed their receiver, it, it persisted. They right. discovered microwave background radiation at a temperature of 2.7 Kelvin. This confirmed the hypothesis of Dick, Peebles, and Wilkinson. In 1978, Penzias and Wilson were jointly awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics for their discovery. Now, this list of predictions goes on. I'll be happy to address that, of course. But at any rate, uh, as far as dogs produce dogs, again, that's not even a prediction. You saw that dogs produce dogs, and you said, well, that, that kind of keeps with, with, uh, with creationism. 
And evolution makes no other prediction about that. The evolution does not predict that dogs would produce anything other than dogs. You have been corrected on this thousands of times. Well, sorry, 187 times. My apologies. Oh. You've been corrected on this 187 times, and yet you still say this. Why do you keep misrepresenting us? This is one of your dishonesties. I don't understand why you do that. Now, the other thing, nobody debates or contests that uh, cat catastrophes occur. What we, do, what we contest is the idea that an entire worldwide catastrophe occurred. That's absolutely, that's absolutely silly. We're discussing, again, predictive power. You have yet to show how any creationist has ever used the assumption of a creation event, let alone a flood event, to find anything that has never been discovered before. You're wondering what the real world application of evolution is. It's that we can make these predictions ahead of time and then discover them. Uh, again, with the farmers, yeah, we absolutely, they absolutely know that they can change an organ organism over time. Now, maybe there are limits. We don't know what they are, but just to say there are limits, that's not even a, con that, there's no quantification there. Clams. Why would we not expect to see clams buried and with their with with their shells closed? They're diggers. They 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 actually go under the earth. That's what they do. They dig into the earth and they keep their mouths closed most of the time. So we should expect to see that. That isn't a predict. Well, it is a prediction, but not made by evolution. But it is a prediction you can make just by looking at the real world. I wish. I had the ability to show video and audio and well, I've got audio, but pictures right now because I do in fact have gravel in my yard that is jagged. It has jagged edges. I can actually, I live out in the desert. I live near Red Rock Canyon. There is gravel there. It is not all rounded. Some of it is quite jagged. Um, nobody says that amoebas are the ancestor of any of the, uh, of any mammal or of any animal. That is, I don't know why you keep saying that. You've been corrected on that as well. Now, uh, what you're asking, you're wondering why can't we breed a dog as big as Texas? How would a dog as big as Texas survive? That doesn't make sense at all. Where are you, where are you coming up with this? Now, the thing is, I don't know if my time is up. I don't know where, uh, I, I, you just have this habit of going from subject to subject. People call it a gish gallop. I think it needs to be renamed the Hoven Hustle because that is pretty insane. So at any rate, the other thing is you talked about planet Earth having the perfect amount of CO2 and oxygen. I did not say that at all. What I said was it had nothing but carbon dioxide to begin with. We can tell this because the very oldest strata we look at has no oxidation whatsoever, only Later, do we see any any signs of oxidation? So, if you want to tell me that those those areas where we don't see any oxidation are pre-flood, then you're going to have to explain why we see life there. Again, I don't know where we are. I don't know. I don't know how much more time we have. But um, I've uh, I've got it at so um, I've got Ken who went um, 12 minutes, and you've got another two and a half minutes, and that would be equal time. So you you, you can use that up if you'd like, Tony, and then we'll jump into discussion. Um, we well, gish out so much that I don't really have, I mean, I, I had to write down furiously and bring up my, uh, my evidence. Um, unfortunately I can't, pro I can't produce the slides. So I'll just go ahead and move on to the next, um, the next issue. Okay. Well, thanks for that rebuttal there, uh, Tony, um, with a couple minutes left, we can just throw that into the discussion. Therefore, uh, whichever one of the debaters would like to start, I've got it. I've got the clock set here. We'll make sure there's no interruptions and it's a, a smooth free flowing dialogue. Go ahead. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, Tony, you, you, you mentioned I've been corrected on things quite a few times. Claiming that I'm wrong does not mean I've been corrected. I would say you've been, you've been corrected tonight. There's no evidence of any animal producing another animal ever. And your charts I showed right from the textbooks, they do teach we all came from an amoeba. Why would you say I've been corrected on that? I'm not been corrected. I was right. What do you mean corrected? Uh, about the oxygen, let's stick with this, just this one. They've always known the Earth has always had oxygen. Back in 1966, they said, what's the evidence for a primitive methane ammonia atmosphere? None. There's no evidence for it. This is National Academy of Sciences. 
about 1976, 10 years later, there's no evidence in the sedimentary distribution of carbon, sulfur, iron, uranium of an oxygen-free atmosphere. Well, how about 1982? It was suggested from the time of the earliest dated rocks, Earth had an oxygen atmosphere. Whoa, 1992. The only trend in recent literature is far more oxygen than early claimed, okay? How about the year 2002? Earth may have had an oxygen-rich atmosphere as long as 3 billion years and possibly even earlier from scientific and industrial research organization, the Commonwealth, okay? So uh, you're simply mistaken. Here's 19, 19, uh, 2018. Today, the atmosphere is 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. In the early Earth, there was very little oxygen. 3.5 billion years ago, there was only 0.001%. This is pure propaganda. They're making this up. The Earth has always had oxygen, and I know it creates a giant problem for you guys who would like life to evolve in an oxygen-free environment. I cover that very thoroughly on my video number four. So you're simply not up to date on the literature, Tony. There is no proof that the Earth was ever without oxygen. It's not true. You need to do some more reading. I'll, I'll send you my seminar series free if you'll watch it. Go ahead. Uh, well, first of all, Kent, I've actually watched every one of your episodes or oh, seminars. Yay. Good. I've watched every one of them more than once. Um, number one, um, <laughs> I'm challenging you to show any scientific paper that has ever said animals have ever come from an amoeba. They never have ever claimed that. I challenge you to show anybody that. Now, as far as your, uh, your statement about oxygen, because you had to go to another subject, not just one, but because you do usually say one subject at a time, here's the second subject. Oxygen. You should look at your own references. This is the problem that I, this is something I've learned from you. And in that one video you cited, I actually point out that you will cite your own references and then the average person will not bother to look them up. I have looked up those references. Almost every one of them, the, you're citing the abstract where they state that, yes, it is assumed that blah, blah, blah happened or that it is assumed that there was oxygen in the, in the early Earth. And then the paper itself goes on to challenge that. The other thing is one of your papers said that there could have been oxygen on Earth as early as 3 billion years ago. That's not the beginning of the Earth. The Earth is proposed to be 4.5 billion years. It's actually, if you even paid attention to what I said, I actually stated that the, Arche the Middle Archean is when we first see oxygen oxygenation or any kind of oxidation in the strata, which is 3.5 billion years ago. So even then, that is the earliest we see oxygen in the, in the, in the geological column. I know you got your own statements about the geological column, but either way, this is, I'm, it's not that I was saying that you're uh, you're being corrected in that you're saying something that's true or untrue. You're saying what evolutionists, if I may use the term, are claiming. We are, you're, so that is where you're misrepresenting. You misrepresent what we are saying, as opposed to misrepresenting perhaps science itself. You are misrepresenting what other people say. Now again, you still have yet to show a single prediction or any real world application of creationism. All you've shown is how we can look at something and say, oh, that happens to totally be conveniently uh, supported by a creationist view. But you, oftentimes you're talking about things that were predicted ahead of time by evolution. That is uh, all I have to say about that. Okay, Tony, I will make a prediction right here in front of the whole world. I predict that one day you will die and stand before God and be judged. That's what the Bible says is going to happen to all of us. I predict if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to go to hell. I'll make that prediction right here, right now. I don't want that for you, Tony. But you've said that I'm saying it's wrong. This is the charts right out of the books. Humans, pine trees, whales, everybody came from a protista, a single-celled organism. That's what they're showing. I'm not making this up. I'm using the charts right out of the book. How about this one? All the animals, humans, everything, everything goes back to a single-celled organism. What am I missing here? I didn't make this stuff up. Here is a, let's see, 2015 biology textbook used in Texas with a chart showing everything going back to a common end. Does it have protista? I didn't have time to read it. It's on the left. On the left? Really, really small. Yeah, I don't have time to find it and read it here, but... I, 
I'll scan it in and show it to you. The books do teach this, Tony. They do teach we came from a single-celled organism. And if you wish to believe that, that's fine. I don't care what you believe. I do resent that being taught as science because it is not science to say we can show that humans and whales and dinosaurs and flowers came from a single-celled protista or an amoeba, whichever one you want to use, a single-celled creature. Don't, don't accuse me of lying and misrepresenting things. I'm not misrepresenting the evolutionist position. I'm accurately showing it, and that's what bothers you, because it looks really stupid when it's shown on paper and somebody points it out. Go for it. Your turn. Okay, first of all, your prediction that I'll die, again, that's really convenient to predict that after you've watched every person that's ever lived die. That's not a prediction. That's pretty much what we see every day. And you didn't get that from the Bible. You got that from watching people die. Second of all, here's the problem. You're saying, you're, you're quoting single-celled animal and you're quoting protista. An amoeba is... Wait, wait, Tony, you left out the last half of my prediction. I predicted you're going to die and stand before God. <clears throat> I've never seen that. Okay, I predict, this, I predict it's going to happen. And wait, I'm going to be standing there and say, wait, Lord, I tried on, to warn him. I tried, Lord. Ken, Go ahead. Hey, Kent, we agreed yeah. ahead of time not to interrupt each other. Did okay. I interrupt you at all? I let no, you but you, you left out part of my prediction. That's all. Go ahead. Go ahead. Take I'll all the time you want. To that. I'll get to that. Now, the second part is amoebas. Amoebas are not protistas. Thank you very much. And by the way, human beings are not protistas. They are not related. Okay? So, um, yeah. Th do, they, do they say we came from a, from a single-celled animal? Yeah. Do you want me to go over the cladistics of it? Because, in fact... The whole idea of cladistics came about by a creationist by the name of Carolus Linnaeus. You know who he was. He was a creationist. He attempted to find the biblical kind. And everywhere he looked, he kept seeing commonalities enough that there was what he put together as a nested hierarchy. And every single creature he looked at continued to show this, sorry, organism, uh, look, he, they, they tended to show a nested hierarchy. Therefore, he was able to predict things like species, genus, and yet those, I, I grant you that genus and, um, and, and, uh, and family and class and order, those are all definitely human uh, terms, and they are actually obsolete, but we do, do still put together this nested hierarchy, hierarchy based on his work. However, the whole reason we have the theory of number one evolution but also the cladistic that we have is because he failed to be able to find the created kinds now as far as your prediction about me standing before god you don't know anything about me you don't even know if i'm a christian or an atheist i've never stated anything either way and i don't care to debate that because this is not about that this is about science now there is no science to be gained from stating that I will die for, and I will and I will face um, a judgment. Where, what what practical application does that have in the world? I will grant you that in your view, that has a practical application in another world, but that's not science. That is definitely the supernatural. I'll let that go. Well, I think the idea that we will stand before a judge, whether it be in eternity or whether it be here on earth, I mean, does, does the idea that people may have to go to court, get arrested, and stand before a judge, does that affect their behavior in the, in the real world today? Why don't people drive 200 miles an hour on the highway? Uh, there are some cars that'll do that. Certainly some motorcycles will do that. Why don't they do it? Well, they're afraid they're going to go stand before the judge one day. They don't want that to happen. So, yeah, the practical application of believing there's going to be a judgment for behavior is that it modifies behavior, hopefully. That's the goal of all the laws that man passes. So, uh, as far as the nested hierarchies, if, if indeed your theory is true that all, everything came from a common ancestor, a protista, which is what the books teach, I've seen some that say amoeba, amoeba. I'll find it and quote it for you. They say, of course, dogs always produce dogs. Well, the amoeba produced the dogs, so the amoeba produced something, or the protista produced something that was non-protista. They do. You guys don't understand the stupidity of the own theory that you say. Well, of course, animal dogs produce dogs. It's always going to be that way. But yet, you think it came from a single-celled creature. This is hypocritical at the least, lying probably at the worst, 
It's simply crazy. Uh, why can we classify animals at all? Why can anybody say, that's a dog, that's a cat? Where's the 99% dog? Where's the 98% dog? Why are there nested hierarchies at all? Why can we even classify them if evolution is true? Are you, are you done? Sure, go ahead. Okay. All right, so as far as, I'll go ahead and go around this. I mean, again, it's uh, like we said, falsifiability. Essentially, if a prediction wrong, it'll pr prove the theory wrong. In other words, if we don't see phenomenon C when we conduct experiment or observation B, then we know theory A is wrong. This is what's called the null hypothesis. So to reference this, um, cite an overused example, if we found fossil bunnies in the Precambrian, common descent would be completely falsified, but we don't. If we found that all strata in the geological column were founded to be t deposited under marine conditions, uniformitarianism would be falsified, but we don't find that. On the other hand, if we never found any fossils, as you predicted, we should have, it would have no bearing on the, vali the validity of your belief in creationism. Now, um, now, as far as the, the relationship, you've used this one before, and it seems like your, your followers are really big on this. As far as the relationship between, let's say, elephants and pine cones, round of applause, both are eukaryotes. You already know that. You state that being a eukaryote is a feature. You said that before. It doesn't prove relationship. And you're right. It doesn't prove creation. It doesn't prove, prove relationship at all. It also doesn't prove creationism at all. Using common descent, though, we can falsifiably predict that all plants, fungi, and animals will possess the definitive features of a eukaryote. They are all eukaryotes. So for the sake of time, I'm going to ne neglect the other forks in the road here, but using common descent, we can falsifiably predict that all chordates, which are defined by a notochord, will retain bilaterian features. They are still bilaterians. We can also falsifiably predict that no bilaterian, bilaterians will have, uh, or no non-bilaterians will have a notochord. So using common descent, we can also falsifiably predict that all chordates, which are defined by a, uh, sorry, uh, sorry that, uh, using common descent, we can also falsifiably predict that all mammals will be chordates. We can also falsifiably predict that no non-chordates will have definitive mammal characteristics. Using common descent, we can falsifiably predict that all, all elephants and primates will retain mammalian features. They are all mammals. We can also falsifiably predict that no non-mammals will retain the characteristics of whales or elephants or primates. In our own interest, using common descent, we can falsifiably predict that all humans will retain the definitive features of primates. This is extremely simplified, but this prediction holds true no matter which branches you choose to take in the nested hierarchy. In fact, you can make the same kinds of predictions going from eukaryotes to plants all the way to pine trees. And you might make the argument that this is the result of a common designer as opposed to common descent. The difference again here is that if we should ever find an organism that defies this nested hierarchy, common descent would be falsified, but you'd still be proclaiming a common designer because creationism can't be falsified. It's therefore scientifically useless. And the evidence of this is that, again, Carolus Linnaeus attempted to find this, to find the, the biblical times and failed. But here you are using a failed attempt at a falsified prediction of creationism as an argument for common design. The irony is thick here. There we go. Well, you keep saying they retain characteristics. Your whole thing is based on the assumption that evolution happened and animals changed. They do teach in the textbooks that single-celled creatures slowly developed into insects, fish, amphibians, birds, monkeys, and humans. This is what they're saying. They're not showing, there's no evidence of this. Nobody's ever seen a butterfly produce a non-butterfly or a butterfly come from a non-butterfly. But this creature back here that turned into both the butterfly and the human, it had to change something. It had to change a whole bunch. There's a lot of differences between a butterfly and a human. So this is what's taught. My objection is this is not part of science. There's no scientific application, even for this teaching, even if it's true. 
They don't retain characteristics. Uh, the, the fact that we can classify animals at all. You mentioned something interesting, though. Elephants and pine cones are both eukaryotes, as if that somehow proves something. <laughs> like, you guys, R and Rod did this all the time, too. Oh, they're both eukaryotes. Yes, boys and girls, eukaryotes developed way back here. That's all that means is the cell has a nucleus which is wrapped in a membrane. I could point out that rocks and ink pens are both attracted by gravity. Whoa, that proves they're related. They actually both take up space. Oh, wow, that proves they're related. This is such a dumb argument. The fact that they're all eukaryotes, come on, get something better than that. The fact that they all have cells which have a nucleus which is wrapped in a membrane does not prove a common ancestor. It's a common building block. I bet all the bicycles and cars and trucks in the world have iron in them. That proves they all came from an explosion in a metal factory. That's the kind of logic you guys use, and you don't see it. The Bible said the scoffers would come in the last days, and they'd be willingly ignorant of the creation. Tony, you don't want there to be a creator, is my prediction. When I really get to find out about you, you're going to say, I don't want, especially the God of the Bible, to be my creator. I don't want to do what he says. That's my prediction. I don't know anything about your lifestyle, but I'd be willing to bet there's a couple things in it that would violate the commandments given in that book, and that's why you hate that book so much. Your turn, Tony. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and go back to exactly what I said at the beginning of this debate. Nobody is saying that any theory can ever be proven. A theory does never graduate to the point of fact. Now, what we once again, you can make an explanation. I can explain that a pink donkey came in and spat this world into existence. Doesn't mean it's true, but it definitely can explain things. What evolution does, what uniformitarianism does, what the Big Bang Theory does, what abiogenesis does, is actually predict the evidence that we find before we find it. That's what makes it scientific. Now, I'll, like I said, even from the beginning, I'll even grant you that none of this happens. But using the assumption, and I'll grant you, it is an assumption because that's how a theory is tested. You assume a theory is true and then say, if we assume this is true, we should see this. It doesn't mean that the theory is true. It just means this theory has predictive value. You have yet to show a single prediction that has ever been confirmed by testing any theory or hypothesis that was, that was derived from the assumption of a creation, creation event 6,000 years ago. And I'll just keep saying that again, because that's what oh, I'm makes sure it you will. I'm sure you'll keep saying it until Judgment Day. That's fine. Um, Hold on the one second, just proven. to make sure. Forgive me. I hate to just to be sure that Tony, were you done with your point? What's that? Well, just to be sure oh, that you yeah, were done yeah, with I'm, your point. Okay, yeah, gotcha. I'm, I'm done with my okay. point. Uh, so, Tony, if neither theory can be proven, which is what you clearly said a moment ago, then why do all of us have to pay for yours to be taught in the schools? I think a whole lot of people are sick of that. Why don't you people who believe you came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago, why don't you go start a private school and teach it without using all taxpayer money? And it's real estate taxes that pay for schools, by the way. Somebody's going to jump on the tax issue and say, Hoven and taxes. Mine was income tax, not real estate tax. And I didn't break the law then. See, Kent Hoven is innocent.com, video number three. But that's a different story. Real estate taxes pay for the schools. All of us are forced to pay for this one religion. This is in the textbooks. I've got hundreds of them here. I can show you. My objection is, I don't care if you believe this stuff. I care that you force everybody to pay to have your religion taught. That's the point. Evolution has no predictive power. The fact that you can find fossils in the ground could easily be just as easily be explained by a flood. A policeman going to an accident, one guy might have a theory that this car was going this way. And this, they might have different theories of what happened. And, and they might work on those, uh, those theories to try to develop, the uh, re reenact the crime or reenact the accident. Sure. We see fossils in the ground. We see layers of strata on top of each other. You guys are teaching the top layers younger than the bottom layer. Oh, really? Where did it come from? Outer space? I think all these layers are the same age. They're all just, they're, even if it's billions of years, they're all the same age. They just got reshuffled. So the idea that one layer can be younger than another is ludicrous on its face. And finding fossils in certain areas, of course, animals are sorted based upon their body density, based upon their habitat, based upon their mobility, based upon their intelligence. Clams are found at the bottom because, as far as we know, they're not too bright. And they're heavy. they got heavy shells. So I think I could predict the order of fossils based upon a flood. 
I'd be willing to predict the slower animals would be buried lower or those that with more body density. Look at body density of reptile compared to body density of mammal or bird. I'd be willing to predict birds are found on top of strata generally because birds are the last ones to drown in a flood. And when they drown, they have hollow bones, hollow feathers, they float. That'd be a prediction based on the flood model. So anyway, we've, we're supposed to take Q&A from the audience. Uh, we've gone a long time here, brother, almost two hours. Um, but well, let's do another one, Tony, anytime. I'll take you on, we'll do another debate. Get your, get your stuff together, okay?